So yes, the title of my talk is Making Data Sing, and the scientific word for that is sonification, or hearing data. When I talk about data, do I mean this guy from Star Trek? No. I mean columns of numbers, math. You can represent columns of numbers with zeros and ones in a computer, and you can also represent those then with color. So this is a way to start abstracting data. We're doing visualization. So once we have a blue dot for every zero and a green dot for every one, we can make a chart, a little pie chart. Everyone has done this. We can put those numbers back on 50-50, but the idea is that we can just look at that chart and understand what's going on in the data. If I add some other colors, we can have a different kind of chart. Let's erase those numbers and make it into three dimensions. This is useless to me because I'm blind in one eye. So I can't see depth, and I think that's probably why I like sound so much. So sound is the only way that I can experience depth in my world. So let's get rid of three dimensions, go back to two dimensions, and talk about what we can do. We can have the size of the data change shape, can be large or small. The individual pieces themselves we can break up and show in different places on the screen and show in different sizes. Let's return to one circle. We can change the shape to represent something different in the data. We can change its color. We can change its shape into a triangle. Now the triangle, unlike the square and the circle, you can rotate this, so orientation matters, just like heads and tails. So let's flip that over. We can add a border. The border's color can change. The border's size can change. We can add a texture into the color of the object. We can add a texture onto the outside. And don't forget, we also have a background. We can put this back to a red circle, all right? Like the one I'm standing on now. Let's remember that we have color, we have shape, we have placement on the screen, we have a border, we have border texture, and let's just texturize that a little bit to look more like this carpet that I'm standing on. Now, I've animated this in my show, but there's a lack now we're sort of stuck, right? What else can we do with this video? So there's one thing missing, and that's sound. So let's add a little sound. That is a sound at 120 hertz. If you saw the red dot blinking, it would be impossible to tell the difference between 120 hertz and 140 hertz, which is the next tone I'm playing. I can make that tone softer. That could indicate something in the variables. I can change the timbre of that tone, and that could indicate something else in the data. I can change the length of the tone, and I can fade in and out the tone. I can also pattern the tone. So if you were paying attention at the beginning, this should start to sound a little familiar. So that is Morse code. Morse code is a way of showing the alphabet in sound. So data, D, A, T, A, in Morse code. In Morse code, it's very simple. You just have da dashes and dots. So these dots, are short sound, the dashes are long sound. So you think that this, there's all that there is to Morse code, right? But you can add a layer. If you have a human operator, the way that humans code that data into sound can change. So instead of da, 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 you could have da, da, da. And in World War II, there were code breakers who actually were able to figure out how the Operators on the German telegraphs were using, they were able to identify individual operators and were able to actually code break the Germans' um, ciphers. Beyond language, sonification is really useful. So we have 
the stethoscope. This is one way that we can amplify our heartbeats. We have an EKG. It tells the nurses that everything's okay or not. Going back to World War II, we have sonar. This is a way that submarine operators can be doing things, but also identifying if there's another ship nearby. Geiger counters enable you to walk around the world, not trip on stuff, but actually hear when you're getting close to radiation. Sonification is not new. So in the 1400s, Robert Hooke tied a string onto a fly to figure out how many times a second the flies beat their wings. And Galileo, whose father was a musician, used an inclined plane with bells stacked in an accelerating pattern to show that gravity will cause acceleration. So the audio you will hear is spaced regularly, however the bells are spaced irregularly. And this proved that as the ball was rolling, it was accelerating because there was larger time between the bells, space. Finally, most recently, we've had gravitational waves. So the chirp. Okay. So gravitational waves and the stethoscope are ways of doing something that is in fact called autification. So that's just translating something that is vibration but translating it into a perceptual realm that we can understand. So why are we gonna sonify? So we can do ambient data researchers um, analysis, so researchers can work on other tasks, and when a sample is measured, our ears have a higher dynamic range and frequency discrimination than our eyes. So I showed you that we can blink 120 times a second or 140 times and we don't recognize it. That is your frequency response, dynamic-wise, our pupils contract and dilate, and our ears don't, so we can actually experience more data at once with our ears. Now, I'm not saying that we should totally go to sound and ignore the visual. I'm proposing that we use them together. So this would be that multi multimodal input can enhance comprehension. So there's some examples of sonification. So this is a stock market. The pitch, this is the closing and the loudness is how many trades were made that day. Then we have Brexit. This has been in the news recently. This is the sound of the pound against the dollar. Each chime is a passing day. The higher the note, the stronger the pound. We're in the run-up to Britain's vote to leave the European Union. And we've British left people have Brexit. Even CERN is getting in on this. So they made a little cute composition when they discovered the Higgs boson. So they created music from the Higgs boson particle. Right? Super fun. Some Scandinavians took that same data and turned it into a heavy metal tune. So the same data, as you can visualize it differently, of course, it can be sonified differently. So today I'm going to talk to you about a few of the sonifications that I have done. I'm going to start with the sonification of nanomaterials. So in nanoscience, you shoot x-rays at a particle, and then you watch how they scatter off of it, and you detect that, kind of like with a digital camera, but for x-rays. And the procedure is that you have a sample, it has some sort of internal structure, there is scattering data, and then you're going to take the integral of the 2 pi d over the length and change that into the integral of frequency over time. This is where my math minor comes in handy. Then we have sound, and it makes ideally an insight. So let's take this sample. It's from a solar cell nanograding. And in all of the examples that I've given so far, the data had a time element, so it was much easier to sonify. So in this case, we have to create a time element by sweeping over the data. And this is what it ends up sounding like. I've also sonified ocean surf. So this is creating sine waves from data. And this is from Hurricane Irene. And you'll be able to hear 
short percolating sounds, which are short waves that you can sort of see, and then there are these undertow waves that are longer tones underneath, and ideally this is going to be a way to save lives so that if there is a strong undertow, we'll be able to know it. I also have been working on a three-dimensional sonification of fMRI data. This has failed miserably. There is too much data. Our computers can't handle it, so I'm hoping to work on this with the Institute for Advanced Computational Science here at Stony Brook. But it's always useful to have examples of things that don't work in science. Something that's working incredibly well, however, is overcoming akinesia with music. So we are working on wireless sensors in your shoes that talk to your phone, and then the only way to hear your music correctly is to walk correctly. So people with Parkinson's disease have trouble generating internal movement cues, and if you give them a light or a sound, such as a metronome, they can walk normally. However, who wants a light showing in front of their path all the time, and who wants to listen to a click all the time? We initially started this by trying to sonify their gait, and what we would get from the control group is pew, 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 and from people with Parkinson's, we got pew, pew. And I was like, they're not gonna wanna listen to that. So instead, we're going to use a distortion on music as a cue. So the only way to hear your music correctly is to walk correctly. And different kinds of distortions will mean different things, such as gate asymmetry or that your steps are getting smaller. The interesting thing about working with scientists is that it's a very slow process. So we couldn't go directly from putting sensors in their shoes to doing tests. First, we had to see if patients with Parkinson's could actually even hear and correct for distortion. So we wrote an iPad app, and this, they were able to hear the sound normally, hear it get distorted, and then try to fix it. And the great thing is that the people with Parkinson's and the control group did equally as well on this task. Love me or leave me and let me be lonely. Finally, today, we're working on an installation that you guys can go see in lecture room one. It's called Hatchek, and it is based on IP data from the Shmoo Group's uh, annual conference. So they sell out of this conference in 20 seconds. We were able to map the data from each of those IP addresses. This is a top-down view. We also have a three-dimensional view. And then I was able to create melodies, harmonies, and drum tracks from that. So here's just a melody created from the IP server logs. So I am, as Lyle said, a composer. And I'm working with physical therapists and neuroscientists to help people with Parkinson's walk but I can also use the sensors that the electrical engineers created and use that for dance. I have been working on the sonification of fMRI data to figure out drug resistance cues, and I could use that to create music. So it didn't work for science, but it did work to create sound that I enjoy. The sonification of nanomaterials, I gave you a 3.5 second example of that. We can stretch that out and I might be able to use that in a composition. And finally, when you go and see the installation, there's a little nod to the Scandinavian distortion And all of these sounds are generated from that IP data. Thank you very much. <laughs>